Uh, episode of Breaking Bad, titled Blood Money, episode 509. In our teaser, we open tight on curving concrete. Polyurethane wheels blur past and our three skateboarding kids carve and grind through the puddles, discard empty plastic bags and dried leaves are inside a swimming pool. This pool is the pool, the White House pool. Dead flowers, trash, plywood covered windows. Out front, the surrounding houses look fine, but the White House stands out like a rotten tooth in a healthy mouth. A 1977 gold Cadillac DeVille quietly rolls up. Driver's door swings open and work boots plant the back blacktop. Bearded, tired Walt climbs out and glances around the tranquil suite. Good, no one's watching. Enters into the White House, empty and pathetic, slivers of sunlight sliced through gaps in the plywood. Looming behind him, bold spray-painted graffiti zigzagging across the wall. Heisenberg. In the bedroom, he pulls out a jackknife, kneels and uses the blade to unscrew an outlet cover. The ricin vial is still right where he left it in episode 502. He peels the ricin vial away and pockets it. Outside, he ducks back out the fence, heading for his car. He rounds to the driver's door, and someone nearby admits a gas. <gasps> oh! Walt turns and sees his neighbor standing in the driveway, frozen with surprise. She's unloading her car from a trip to the market. At the sight of Walt's face, she drops her grocery bags in shock. He nods to his neighbor, yep, unhurried, and without speaking a word, he climbs back into the gold caddy and drives off. Off this tableau, dumbfounded neighbor staring after Walt, groceries scattered around her, the boarded up, abandoned White House. We end the teaser. White House master bedroom, tight on the closed bath bathroom door. It slowly creaks open, and we're looking straight into Hank Schrader's stunned eyes. It's moments after 508 ended, and he's just begun processing what he's learned. And then Hank heads down the hallway, following the book, carrying it slowly. There's a large purple tote bag on the counter, unmistakably Marie's. Turning away from Walt, Hank tucks the leaves of grass into the bag and takes a moment to steal himself. The party continues out in the patio, exactly where we left it in 508. Oh my god, Skylar! I know, right? Well, actually, those were my ideas, so you're welcome. You are the devil! <laughs> hey, you want another? Hank? Uh, no, thanks. Listen, I uh, hate to end this, but I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100. percent Oh no, I hope it wasn't something you ate. No, no, I'm just, I, I don't know. We, we have Pepto, Uncle Hank. Thanks, buddy. I'll be fine. Just uh, maybe better shove off. Sorry, baby. I, I hate to leave you with the cleaner. No, no, don't worry about it. We got plenty of help. Minutes later, out front, a relaxed Walt sees the Schraders to Hank's Tahoe. Walt smiles are genuine, doesn't realize that this is it. Life as he knows it is over. Nothing will ever be the same. Well, this was fun. Let's do this again soon, huh? Absolutely. It's been too long. Yeah. Hank's got the purple tote with the leaves of grass hidden inside. Walt gets the door for him. Hey, you okay to drive? Yeah. yeah. All right, we'll feel better. He gives Walt a tight little smile as he climbs behind the wheel. Will do. Blissfully clueless, Walt waves as the Tahoe pulls away. Hank drives in silence, his thoughts a million miles off. Marie pulls down the vanity mirror and examines her hair, looking to see if it's as shiny as Skylar said. Europe. Were you there when she said that? I mean, seriously. Europe? How's your stomach? <laughs> Jesus, Europe, the two of them. They were just three or four months ago, and now Italy, France, the way she was talking, it practically sounds like a second honeymoon. Oh my God, I'm so happy for them. All right, I'm jealous. I'm happy and I'm jealous. We need to go to Europe, Hank. Can't can it be like like a, a, a business trip? Don't they have drug dealing in Europe? <laughs> Throughout all of this, Hank grips the wheel deep in thought. Remember that junk Kent Burkert went to and went on two years ago, New Zealand? Kathy went too. I mean, she paid her airfare, but the mm -hmm. rest was on Uncle Sam. You're at his level now. Couldn't there be something in Italy? Maybe Lake Como? Is it Como, by the way? Like Perry Como or is it Cuomo, like Mario Cuomo? See to me that sounds more Italian. <laughs> Creeping in on Hank as his mind races, putting together the pieces, GB and WW. Small. The sound of Hank's own breathing takes over, faster and shallower. Marie's still talking. Her voice seems far away. The flashes of sunlight go brighter. Marie real realizes something's wrong. She asks a question, but all we hear is Hank's breath. The world outside is swirling by, sun blasting from all the reflective surfaces. Closer on Hank. Flash, flash without re realizing it. Hank's leaning on the gas. He clutches the wheel, fingers digging into the plastic, jaw tight, guts twisting, breast shallow and fast. Thud, Hank loses control of the Tahoe. Hank! The SUV jumps the curb, creams a mailbox, and comes to a rolling stop in the front yard of a neat house. <clears throat> Hank spills out of the driver's side and lurches into a close-up. Marie's behind him, his voice still oddly distant. Oh my god, Hank? Here in the foreground, Hank manages a half-hearted wave of his hand. I'm fine, I'm fine, not that we believe it. Everything sounds completely underwater now as Marie rushes to her husband, laying hands on him. In the background, a homeowner steps out of his house, headed our way. Please call an ambulance! Off Hank shutting his eyes and struggling to catch his breath, the whole world going into slight slow motion. In the Schrader house kitchen that night, hours later, later <coughs> Hank and Marie enter, the worse for the wear, and in mid-conversation. Hank's carrying the purple tote bag, and Marie's got the rest of the stuff from lunch. 
I'm just saying. There's an accident. I'll make the appointment. All you have to do is show up. Ted Kaiser told her anything about what's on his mind. He's only given her half his attention. He uses a steak knife to saw through the hospital van. What? Three hours in the emergency room and all of it to nothing. Just like I told her what else she wanted. All they did was rule out a heart attack. What if it happens again? It's not going to happen again. How can you know that? You can't say what it was in the first place. All right. Baby, I'm fine, okay? Just trust me, discussion over. And do not tell Scott. What? Why? There's nothing to be embarrassed about, Hank. Hank? But Hank is already headed off, without breaking stride. And just out of Marie's sight, he smoothly slips the copy of Leaves of Grass from his purple tote. Marie lets him go. In the garage, Hank locks the door and flips on a light. Still holding Walt's book, he goes to a pile of miscellaneous in the corner and moves stuff aside until he uncovers a banker's box. He lifts the box under his workbench. It's marked Bedeker. He rifles through the files and, pa and the paperwork and finds what he's looking for, the color Xerox of Gail Bede Bedeker's notebook. Just very deliberately, he compares the notebook to the inscription in Walt's copy of Leaves of Grass. And no doubt about it, it's a match. Hank stares, churning. He's still not thinking like a, he's not thinking like a cop now. This is more than evidence in a case. This is life-shattering treachery. Betrayal. Too deep for words. At the car wash. The car wash security door rolls up, revealing Walt. He's in a good mood, at peace with himself. It's the first thing in the morning. He's opening the car wash for business. He steps back to allow the early bird car wash worship workers to file past. He greets them by name in Facebook Spanish. First oh, in Mariano. Hola, Mariano. Buenos dias, Luis. Salvador, Enrique, Feliz Cumpleaños, Re Enrique. <laughs> what a great boss. Last in is Skyler. <laughs> Air fresheners fill the frame. Rows of little trees, apples and oranges, sleeped in plastic, adjust to reveal Walt restocking the display from a box. He appraises the display, an idea forming. Nearby Mariano rings up customers. Thank you. Please give this to your car wash professional. Have an A1 day. Hear that? <laughs> it's a new greeting. And over at the second counter, a sign reads complimentary. Help yourself and eat coffee station. Looks like Skylar's continuing to make improvements while Gaze lingers on the air fresheners. I think we might be missing a, a bat here. At the intake area, where the customers first roll up to the car, to the car wash, workers vacuum, Skylar finishes up with an incoming customer. Here you go. There's complimentary coffee inside while you're waiting. Have an A1 day. Customer smiles and moves on. Walt approaches Skylar. Air fresheners are high margin, right? That 30 cents wholesale, you bet. Uh, okay, so I'm thinking we reorganize this, the display. Separate the food from the nature sense. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to have bubble gum next to ocean spray. And pine's still our big seller, right? Maybe we move that over to the register next to the five-hour energy. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would be fine. Yeah. Listen, um, speaking of business, the story comes first. We're car wash owners, pure and simple. But if our story is that the car wash is successful... It, it is successful. Right, right. right. And, and what do successful car wash owners do? They buy more car washes. You'll be laundering that money for years, decades. Wouldn't it be better than one? I mean, couldn't the story have a happy ending? Well, um, there's General Hands over by Kirtland. I, I, I love that location. Sure. Let me, let me think about it. Yeah, yeah, oh, sure, later. Yeah, to be continued. Walt heads back inside, please. For the first time in well, pretty much forever, Skyler and Walt are almost on the same page, and if this continues, it will be Walt's greatest triumph. Once he's gone, another customer rolls up. Skyler approaches this next car in line, and a familiar figure in dark glasses and heels climb out. Holy shit, it's Lydia over dark quail. She glances around, a little nervous. Skyler's never laid eyes on Lydia, as far as she's concerned, another customer. Good morning. Welcome to A1. Lydia hands Skyler her keys on the surface, just a neutral professional transaction. Just the regular, please. Um, we're having a special on hand wax, uh, $21.99 if you're interested in getting rid of those water spots. Just a regular is fine. Great. There's complimentary coffee inside. Have an A1 day. Lydia heads inside. Skylar gives Lydia's key car keys a subtle double take before she continues to the next car. What does she notice that we didn't? At the register area, Walt has taken over the register, ringing up a customer while Mariano refreshes coffee. Lydia enters. Walt glances, glances her way to make change, eyes darkening with anger as he recognizes her. Please give this to your car wash professional and have an A1 day. Customer steps away. Now it's Lydia's mm. turn. Well, it plays his role, but there's a dangerous undertone. Morning. May I have your ticket, please? 68% and falling. I knew there would be a drop in quality, but 68%, this is not what I agreed to. I left a viable operation. The rest is up to you. Ticket, please. 
I'm only asking for a few days, a week at most. Call it a tutorial. That's the standard wash? Fix this. Get the ship back on course. We'll make it worth your while. That comes to $14.95, please. Listen, this is a complicated situation. There are a lot of moving parts. None of which are my concern. You are putting me in a box here. You know what could happen. Again, not my concern. Thank you. Please give this to your car wash professional and have an A1 day. Listen, I only... Lydia trails off. Skylar is just now entering. Missing all of this, Skylar steps over to exchange paperwork with Mariano. Uh, well, it'll only be a few minutes. There's complimentary coffee if you like. There's no way for Lydia to pursue this without making a public scene. She's failed. <coughs> Frustrated, she gives Walt one last pleading glance. She turns on her heels and walks out. Walt realizes Skylar staring after Lydia. What's up? <sighs> Just wondering who washes a rental car. Walt, who was that? A former business associate. She wants me to come back, and I won't. He watches Skylar while she considers. Is she surprised by his honesty? Purposeful, Skylar heads out after Lydia. Uh, Skylar. What is she doing? Well, it's not sure what Skylar's up to, and neither are we. In the finishing <coughs> area, Lydia's pissed, hammering away on her Blackberry. She's hovering near a rental car And then, here comes Skylar, all business. She nods at the worker, doing the wipe down. Salvador, this one's finished. Terminado. The guy grabs his chamois and moves on to the next car in line, li leaving Lydia's rental dripping. Get out of here. Now. Excuse me? Never come back here. Do you understand? The look in Skylar's eyes is truly frightening. Holy shit, this is Mrs. Heisenberg, Lydia Wilts. Under Skylar's pitiless gaze, Lydia climbs into her rental. She fumbles with the door, managing to shut it. Through the windshield as Lydia starts the car and dares to glance back, Skylar's still there. Once Lydia is out of glaring range, Skylar drops her fierce mask. The confrontation cost her. She was projecting a hard-ass confidence that she doesn't quite feel. Walt is in the background watching from inside the car wash, off him uncertain of what just happened, but maybe just a bit impressed. On the deck, Hank stares out at the desert landscape, lost in thought. He's wearing the same sweats and t-shirt he went to bed in. For two sleepless days, he's been struggling with himself. He hasn't said a word about his suspicions to his wife. Whatever her intentions, Marie couldn't keep it to herself. The door slides open and out comes Marie, dressed for work in her white lab coat. She brings him a steaming mug of coffee. Thanks. You going in today? Uh... Maybe if you took a shower and got dressed, you'd feel better. No, I'm going to work from home. Hank, you don't need to tell me you're going to work from home if you're not going to work from home. I'm working from home. I'm the boss, Marie. If I'm not feeling 100%, I can work from home. You say so. I've got to go. Bye-bye, boss man. She gives him a kiss on the cheek and heads inside. In the kitchen, close on yellow packets of Splenda lined up neat marching order next to Marie's travel mug. She finishes prepping her morning coffee. She's giving the coffee one final stir when someone's at the front door. She sweeps the empty packets in the trash, grabs her lunch bag, and heads to the front. Opens the door to find two DEA guys, Scott and Artie, waiting outside. An SUV is parked in the driveway. Morning, Mrs. Schrader. Hey, guys. What's up? Just dropping these off, ma'am. Where would you like them? They brought a dolly laden with boxes of DA case files. They're stamped with the word copy in red letters. Hank appears behind Marie. No smile for his guys. Uh, bring them around to the garage. I got it. Have a good day. You too. In the garage, ten minutes later, Marie's gone. The guys are finished piling boxes atop a workbench. Hank's cleared aside his straighter bow equipment to make room for the files. Boss, John has said to tell you a few of these might not have the indexes. We could give you a hand sorting through them, though. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Tell her not to worry. Thanks, guys. In other words, don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. He grabs the remote, the door rattles closed, shutting the DEA guys out as they head for the truck. Now he's alone. He's hoping against hope the files will tell him another story. He's praying he's simply wrong, but there's another way to look at this. He opens a box at random and begins a montage covering hours of work that he methodically examines the files. In Jesse's house, living room, close on Jesse, sprawled on the couch, red-eyed and unshaven. He looks like crap warmed over. Jesse's been self-medicating for weeks. We stay on Jesse for a moment while he half listens to his buddy shooting off the shit. He spent too much time alone with his thoughts. These guys are a welcome distraction. You grab some Andorian stash. He comes after you with a disruptor. You yell, beat me up, Scotty, and you were so <laughs> out of there. What's not to love? That's what I'm saying. You didn't get away. You're dead. You you got vaporized. Dude, you're tripping. I'm not dead. I'm up on the Enterprise. Mac and Yeoman <laughs> Rand and the Andorian with the disruptors still down on uh, Talos 4 or whatever. Oh, uh, man, what do you think all those sparkles and shit are? 
Transporters breaking you apart, yo. Down to your molecules and bones. It's making a copy. That dude who walks out on the other side, he's not you. He's a color Xerox. So every time Kirk goes in the transporter, he's killing himself? So over, like, the whole series, there's been, like, 147 Kirks? At least. Yo, why do you think McCoy never likes being in nowhere? Because he's a doctor, bitch. It's science. Look it up. Did I ever tell you about my Star Trek script? Your Star Trek script? Oh yeah, I got. all I gotta do is write it down. <coughs> the Enterprise is five parsecs out of Rigel, Rigel 12. Nothing's going on, neutral zone's quiet. The crew's bored, so they put on a pie-eating contest. The whole crew's in the galley, they're eating tulaberry pies. Tulaberry? Tulaberries, they're from Gamma Co Quadrant, yo. Dude, that's Voyager. All right, blueberries, okay? They're eating blueberry pies. Fast the re replicators can churn them out. Tss, tss, tss. Finally, it's down to three. Kirk, Spock, and Chekhov. Okay, Spock always wins these things. How can Spock beat Kirk? Spock's like a toothbrush. Look at Kirk. Dude's got room to spare. Spock's got, like, total Vulcan control over his digestion. You want to hear this or not? Yeah, go, go. Okay, <laughs> finally, Kirk can't take anymore. He yorks! Now it's just Spock and Chekhov. But the thing is, Chekhov's got a whole stack of Qualus writing on this, and he's figured out how to win. He's got Scotty down in the transporter room, and Scotty's locked in on Chekhov's stomach. Soon as Chekhov eats a pie, Scotty beams her right out of him. Where is he sending them? The toilet? Space! All them chewed up well, blueberries and crusts and stuff are just floating out there, float frozen solid. Okay, Chekhov's shoveling them in like a machine, and now Spock's sweating green blood. This little Russian's killing him. But meanwhile, Scotty's in there pushing the levers, and Lieutenant Luhura comes in, and she brushes him with those big pointies, and Scotty's <laughs> fingers get all sweaty. No! No! Yeah! Chekhov screams, blood spurting out of his mouth. Scotty just beamed his guts into space. No way! <laughs> <laughs> Jesse reappears, carrying two heavy duffel bags, heading for the front door. We might recognize these as the bags Walt gave Jesse in 508. They zipped up tight, but we recall seeing five million bucks in there. Where are you going, man? You're missing the best part. You want some company? No, uh, I'm good. <clears throat> so Chekhov's dead? Sick bay. McCoy's got to do some experimental transplant with a Gorn guts he's got in cold storage. What do you think? What's your B story? <laughs> <laughs> In Saul Goodman's office lobby, God Bless America plays over to new speakers as we move past Saul's retail clientele. We land on Jesse's battered skate shoes atop the duffel bags. He's using the unseen money as a footrest in the middle of Saul's waiting room. Enough waiting, though. Jesse turns to Francesca. She's sitting inside her glassed-in receptionist desk. Yo! She glances up at him, then goes back to her copy of Travel and Leisure, the definition of passive-aggressive. Fuck it, Jesse's gonna force the issue. He pulls out a joint, strikes a match, and lights up. Behind the glass partition, Francesca frowns at this. She looks at Huel. Reluctantly, Huel moves over to Jesse. No, you can't do that here. Conversation around him halts. Everyone watches the brewing confrontation. Jesse looks up at Huel, smoke curling out of his nose. How far will he push this? Come on, man, give me a break. Jesse doesn't budge. He gives Huel the stink eye. Stand off. Meanwhile, <coughs> Francesca picks up the intercom phone and rings into it. Then the office door creaks open, just enough to allow Saul's arm to wave Jesse in. Jesse doesn't break eye contact with Huel, and Francesca leans into her mic. Pinkman, he'll see you now. Taking his sweet time, Jesse drops the joint, grinds it out, and humps the bags inside. While he's gone, Huel shuts the door behind him and resumes his post. Saul buttons his shirt as he escorts Jesse inside. A tiny masseuse folds her portable table. Could be Jesse has interrupted a happy ending. Uh, the prodigal returns. Sorry for keeping you on ice, but if I'd known you were out there, then Francesca, I warned her one more time and it's back to the DMV. So, uh, on our own today. Bond door open! <laughs> Bond door. Uh, oh. Yeah, so how is the maestro? Uh, things have been quiet on this end. I haven't seen him. Just as well, maybe. I, the whole thing in the jails. I mean, once they start off with lawyers, uh, I, I draw the line. This goes to Kaylee Ermintrout. This one, Mr. and Mrs. Albert Sharp, 315 East Pueblo, up in White Horse. Two and a half million each bag. Total of five. Mr. and Mrs. Who? Drew Sharp's parents. Drew Sharp. Oh, with a kid on TV M missing a. Why would you? Oh, uh, scratch that. I don't. I don't know. I don't want to know. The only thing I'd say is that uh, you know those folks want to know what happened to their boy. A bag of cash. It's only going to raise more questions. And Kaylee Ehrman Trout. That's Mike's granddaughter. Right. Right. So this is Mike's money. 
Mine. Your money, okay? And and you're giving it to Kaylee Airman Trout? It's what Mike wanted. Sure, you and Mike, uh, you've been in touch. But you know the little girl. You got some kind of bond or... So we're talking about what? The charity? <laughs> Look, shelling out for the ex and her little boy, I kind of get it. Kind of. But this is the bridge too far. I mean, I hate to tell you, but you're still going to be two miracles short of sainthood. Our right, brass tacks. My job is to advise, and my advice is think again. You got a guilty conscience? Visit the house of worship of your choice. But with all due respect, this ain't going to fly. Kiddo, you're you're all heart, and I, I love that. But come on already. Mike left one step ahead of the boys in blue, and you better believe his family's on the radar. A couple million bucks shows up. The cops are grabbing it. Too sweet. The feds have already taken away Kaylee's money twice. Why go for the hat trick? I'll freaking do it myself. Hey, whoa, 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 hold on. I was just thinking out loud. <laughs> Enough bullshit, all right? You're going to do it or not? Yes, absolutely. I live to serve, <coughs> right? There, listen, kiddo. Maybe think about <coughs> cleaning up, you know, getting some rest. You, you've looked better. I just get it done. Jesse exit. Saul thuds the bags down on his desk. He takes a break, deep breath, stealing himself for his next move. He slides open the desk drawer, selects one of the half dozen drop phones inside, and dials a number from memory. You know who this is? Hey, don't hang up. Hey, yeah, yeah, there's a problem. Five million of them on my desk right now, brought over by our hip hop friend. We tight on Walt, talking on the drop phone, his last connection to his former empire. But where is he? We can't say for sure. What did he want you to? We only hear Walt's side of the conversation as he listens. No, don't. Just hold on. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I'll handle it. Walt hangs up, cutting wide to reveal he's back in the chemo infusion room. First seen in 105 rows of patients, padded recliners hooked to IV drips. Walt's cancer is back. Beginning of Act 3, Jesse's house living room. Jesse's sprawled out on the floor, flat on his back, eyes wide open. Someone's rapping at the door. Jesse! Jesse! Jesse's eyes cut over when he realizes he's out there. Jesse, it's me. Now Walt's at the window, his shadow in the curtains as he raps on the glass. Jesse pulls himself to his feet, knocking over a bong as he goes. Bong water floods. Without waiting, Jesse collapses in a chair, as, it, as if the effort of getting up exhausted him. Walt stands in the doorway, money bags in hand, surveying the chaos and drug paraphernalia. He steps in, drops the bags on the floor, and shuts the door behind him. There's your boo, huh? All right, talk me through this, would you? What are you thinking? What you asked Saul to do, it's just nonsensical. Do you have any explanation at all? Blood money. What? Like you said, it's, uh, it's blood money. I said, all right, yes. Yes, I said that. It was, it was in the heat of the moment and I was just, I was trying to win an argument. I was wrong. This is your money. You've earned it. <sighs> Drew Sharp? That, that is a terrible memory, no doubt about it. But Jesse, you did not kill that child. Did you know Todd was carrying a gun? Did you? No, of course not. Neither did I. There was no way we could have known them, what he was about to do. And I can tell you, as a father, I can tell you that your money won't help that boy's parents. There's nothing that we can do for that family, and that is a fact. Look, you need to, you need to stop focusing on the darkness behind you. The past is the past. Nothing can change what we've done, but now it is over. You're out. And so am I. That's right. I'm done. I'm done too. I've been out for about a month. Look, I am not asking you to forget. I know we never will. But there's nothing left for us to expect except life. There's nothing for us to do except live ordinary, decent lives. A moment of silence. Walt, what's really going on with Jesse? There's something that Walt doesn't quite understand. Why 
Kaylee Ermintraut. She needs somebody looking after her. Mike is more than capable of taking care of his own granddaughter. I don't think so. I don't think he is capable. You know, I don't think he's coming back. He's... I mean, what, 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 what are you saying? You're doing what you did. Off in Mike's guise. If Mike were out there, you'd have to look over your shoulder for the rest of your life. That's not how you do things. I think he's dead, and I think you know that. No. I don't know that. I don't. Listen to me. I did not kill Mike. Last I saw him, he had his bag, the one that I brought for him. He got into his car and he drove away. As far as I know, he is alive and well. And if he comes back, and, and he doesn't understand why I did, why I had to do what I did, well then, that will be on me. Jesse, I need you to believe this. It's not true. It's just not. So he's out there. It's okay. Yes. Mike is fine wherever he is. We both know that he can take care of himself. And he can provide for his own family. Okay. I need you to believe me. Yeah, no. Like you say, he's, uh, he's alive. He's alive. Absolutely. The air is leaking out of Jesse. He's diminished. Something has been broken, and Walt's lies are powerless to fix it. Off Walt and Jesse, sitting in the wreckage of Jesse's life, five million dollars of blood money between them. In the White House dining room, Skyler and Walt, Wa Skyler, Walter Jr. make small talk over dinner. Walt's doing a good job of simulating engagement, but we sense his mind is elsewhere. Well, you've got to have a, co a college counselor, or, or are they bringing in someone new? Oh no. Maybe she'll be back. Well, what if she's not? I mean, what are you gonna... What are you supposed to do? What's Lewis doing about it? <laughs> He's not worried. <sighs> sure, what's to worry about? It's just college, right? Skylar throws a look of mild ex exasperation to Walt. Back me up here. Takes a moment for Walt to jump on board. College? Yes. No, I mean, nothing is more important. Don't, don't worry, they'll replace her. She already had one foot out the door. Oh, um, Uncle Hank's still not feeling well, so, uh, bowling's off for tomorrow night. Really? Really, you're saved from a night out with family. You don't actually have to look so happy. <laughs> I'll be right back. Staying on Walt as he flashes a cramped smile, gets up and heads for the bathroom. The conversation continues behind him. Out of his family's view, Walt is grim. Step rapid. If bowling's off, can I, can I get a late curfew? How late is late? <laughs> Walt moves down the hall into the master bathroom. He closes the door, locks it. Moving with deliberate urgency, he opens the cabinet under the sink, fishes around, pulls out a prescription bottle he's hidden down there. Walt is keeping his relapse a secret from his family. With controlled desperation, he struggles with the childproof cap and shakes out a pill. Before he can swallow the medicine, oh shit, nausea, nausea surges. Too late for the pills. He quickly turns both taps on full blast, falls to his knees, flips the toilet seat up, and bends over, his hands gripping the rim as he vomits. In Kilroy framing, Walt's face peeps over the top of the toilet. Hoping for a distraction, Walt's gaze wanders the magazine st stacked atop the toilet <laughs> tank. But wait a minute. Is something missing? He reaches up and shuffles the magazines around. Shouldn't his copy of Leaves of Grass be up there? But the nausea surges again, interrupting the moment. Off Walt, ducking out of frame, puking again. In the bedroom, close on Skylar in bed, lying on her side, facing us. Mm, you can turn the light off. Yes, have you seen Leaves of Grass? Mm. What? My book, Walt Whitman. 
Dark green, hardcover. Mm, I didn't even know we had that. Finally, Junior. You're <laughs> kidding, right? Yeah. Let me turn up. <clears throat> Willing it to be true, he takes off his watch and slides into bed, kills the light. What's wrong with Hank? Mm, stomach bug sounds like he hasn't been to work all week. Um, good night. Skylar drifts off to dreamland and Walt lies in bed staring at the ceiling, his watch tick tick ticking on the bedside table thinking it over. <coughs> Outside at 2am, Walt pads out in his barricade t-shirt and sweatpants. There's no menacing parked cars, no Tuco or Gus Spring, no danger around anywhere, and far away a dog barks. A little sheepish, my imagination's playing tricks, Walt heads back inside. Then a new thought occurs and he walks over to his Chrysler. He runs his fingers under the back bumper, works his way around the car, feeling under the doors, the rear bumper, what's he looking for? His fingers brush something. Something that doesn't belong. Could it be? Walt stands up and examines what he's just found. <coughs> Praying it isn't what he thinks it is, he now realizes. It's an electronic device, about the size of a chewing gum pack. But Walt knows this is a GPS tracker, the kind that Hank uses. He stands here, frozen, staring out into the night. The day he thought would never come has arrived. Hank suspects, perhaps even knows. Holy shit. <coughs> Beginning shit. of Act 4. The Doghouse Restaurant. Tell to reveal a shopping cart man digging in an overflowing dumpster. Finished with the dumpster, he wheels away, pushes over to Jesse's Toyota. The guy peers in. Jesse's leaned way back in the driver's seat, high and checked out. Walt's little pep talk only drove him deeper into despair. Mister, can you help me out? He ring his rings hit the glass as he raps on the window. Jesse jolts out of his haze, startled. Spare some change. Jesse shakes his head. The shopping cart man veers away, moving slowly. Jesse watches him go, and as he does, something clicks. He rolls his window down. Hey, uh, come back. Yeah, you. Come here, um, I got something for you. He wanders closer. His eyes widen when he sees Jesse holds out a banded stack of money. Thousands of dollars. But he hesitates. There's got to be a catch. Go ahead. Take it. Jesse shoves the cash in his hand. Jesse nods at the guy. It's cool. He starts his Toyota and hits the gas. Drives away into the night. On a rundown street, it's the silence between late night and early morning. Various angles establish this quiet, working-class neighborhood. And thump, something comes flying to the shot, slaps the side of a dilapidated house, and lands on the doorstep. It's a bundle of money. Jesse slowly cruises the neighborhood, robotically tossing banded money out both windows like a crazed paperboy. Bundles hit lawns. They slide across car hoods, splash in puddles. Hundreds of thousands of dollars get scattered like supermarket circulars. Tight on Jesse. No joy, no release. Here is Jesse Pinkman, reckless, hopeless, making the only gesture he can think of, and at the end of his rope, like we've never seen him before, off him throwing yet another bundle. In the Schrader house the next day, a box lands on Hank's garage floor. The DA guys are back, delivering another set of files. A whining sound pitches up and down in the distance. Uh, that's good right there, thanks. We're going to see you today? You're seeing me now. Hank wants these guys gone so he can get back to work. He's dressed and showered, but he's unshaven, so there's the haunted look in his eyes, which he's trying to hide from them. Anything you want us to tell Steve Gomez? Says he's worried about you. Yeah, tell him I got two grandmas already. <laughs> tell everybody more or <laughs> less worry. Guess we better hit it. You guys have a good day. Hank starts organizing the boxes. The DEA guys head to their truck. We pan with him to reveal the whinings coming from a neighbor kid standing in his driveway with a remote control car. He scoots his tiny car out of the way as a large black vehicle slides past. It's Walt's Chrysler parking next to the DEA truck. Hank takes immediate notice. He watches from inside. Full of heat and dread as Walt climbs out of the Chrysler, grinning at the DEA guys. Walt's being incredibly ballsy here. He can't know how far Hank's taken his suspicion. Is Walt already the target of an official investigation? Do the DEA guys already know? Morning. Walt, how you doing? The agents are happy to see Walt. The boss's brother-in-law is a familiar and trusted face. Shoulder pats and handshakes. Hank watches all of this, tucking files back into boxes without taking his eyes off Walt. Hey, Scott. Artie, how's your son's arm? Back to 100%. We're going to district. I'm kidding. That's great. Everything good with you? Yeah, good, good, good. I yeah, can't complain. Guys, uh, you're on the clock here. Oh. See you, Walt. <laughs> Bye. Good to see you guys. The guys drive off. Walt watches them go. Now it's just Walt and Hank. Walt's clean-shaven and rested. Hank's haggard and sleep-deprived. Nice guys. Mm -hmm. The last thing Hank needs is to put Walt on notice that he's in his sights. Hiding his rage is his only option. Meanwhile, Walt effortlessly plays the roles of the good old Walter White, concerned brother-in-law. Well, I'm glad to see you're up and about. How are you feeling? I don't know. I've been better. Did you end up seeing a doctor? 
I mean, when one of these things goes on for a few days, you might want to get that checked. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm on the upswing. Good. Great. Great. Just hate to think of something you ate at our place. You know, when I heard you weren't going to work. And... But, looks like you've got work coming to you. Perks of being the boss, huh? Have things at the car wash. Good. Really good. Hey, did you have any of that potato salad? Hmm? I don't know, maybe. But see, that's what concerns me, because I, I saw it sitting out in the sun for a while. That's never a good thing. I guess I am not. Well, I, nobody else got sick, so I guess I shouldn't worry. What brings you here, Walt? Just in the neighborhood. I guess I should have brought some chicken soup, huh? So, yeah. Skylar will be glad to hear you better. Speaking of which, I guess I better be get getting back at it. So let me know if there's anything I can do. Feel better. Walt turns to go and stops in his tracks. He can't leave it like this. Walt knows and Hank knows that he knows. But there's something else Walt has to put on the table. He turns back to Hank, keeping it light. Oh, you know, there's one more thing. <laughs> You're gonna laugh, but I <laughs> gotta ask you about this. Believe it or not, I found it on my car. I mean, it looks just like the the uh, GPS tracker we used on Gus Fring back when you were tracking him, the two of us. You wouldn't know anything about this, would you? Well, it offers the tracker for Hank to take, but Hank doesn't reach for it. The remote control car whines, pitching higher and higher. Without a word, Hank presses the button on the garage door opener. He eyeballs well as the door rattles down, closing them off from the world. Hank. Everything okay? Gotta say, I don't like the way you're looking at me right now. Who's gonna make the next move? It's a Sergio Leone showdown, and it's dramatic as fuck. <laughs> Hank decks Walt with a locomotive force. Walt slams backwards into the garage wall, tools hang from the wall, and Walt whacks a few on his way down. They fall, clattering around him as he hits the concrete floor. He shakes his head clear and slowly pulls himself into a sitting position. Hank looms over him. <coughs> It was you all along, you, who drove into traffic to keep me away from that laundry. And that call I got telling me Marie was in the hospital, that wasn't Pinkman, who had my cell number. Hank. You killed ten witnesses to save your sorry ass. You bombed a nursing home. Heisenberg, you lying two-faced sack of shit. Hank. Just hold on. I... Uh, I don't know. I don't know where this is coming from. So help me, Christ! I'm going to put you under the jail. Just take a breath, please. Listen to yourself. You sound. I. What you're talking about? These wild accusations. They could destroy our family. And for what? Family. Like you give a shit. Hank, the cancer's back. Good. Right, you son of a bitch. I'm sorry you feel that way. But I think you're missing my point. I want to beat this thing. I'm, I'm back on chemo. I'm fighting like hell. But the truth is, this is the end game. Within six months, you won't have anybody to persecute. Where's the prosecutor going back? On that, we'll agree to disagree. <coughs> but even if somehow you were able to convince anyone that I've done these things, we both know that I will never see the inside of a jail cell. 
Hank, I'm a dying man who runs a car wash. My right hand, to God, that is all I am. Hank, what's the point? We have Skyler bring the kids here. Then we can talk. That is not going to happen. I don't know who you are. I don't even know who I'm talking to. If that's true, if you don't know who I am, then maybe your best course of action would be to tread lightly. It's not a threat. It's a warning. Even with all the cards on the table, Walt doesn't want to unleash hell on his own brother-in-law. Very deliberately, Walt tugs a blue shop towel from Hank's wall dispenser and wipes blood from his mouth. The flags are planted. These two are enemies. This is war.